So as we record tonight's program, uh, feel free to offer comments in the comment box. Uh, we also have a Q&A, you'll see at the bottom, there's a Q&A button. So if you have specific questions that you want to ask Gail, um, do so there. And you can also raise your hand and we can call on you at the end of the presentation. I will be uh, making sure or ask that you continue to stay mute um, so we can hear our guest speaker. And at the very end of the program, when you close out of the meeting, a survey will pop up uh, and we use these surveys. They're so important to us to get a better sense of uh, how our programs make an impact in the community, uh, including our Zoom large uh, com virtual community. So thank you very much for that. Uh, tonight's program, we have the Rust, the Slades and the Burrows with Gail Golick. And I just want to introduce her quickly. Um, Gail is a lifelong New Hampshire resident, working for over 20 years as an archaeologist, studying cultures and people of the region throughout its 12,000 plus year history. She writes, produces, and hosts a history podcast called The Secret Life of Death, where she delves into details of the lives of regular New Englanders, starting with their gravestone. Currently, she lives in Walpole with her husband, their dog, and cats. So we uh, welcome tonight uh, Gail Golick, and I'd love to turn it over to you now. All right, wonderful. Great, thank you so much, Jenna, and thank you all for coming to the presentation this evening. Uh, as Jenna said in the beginning right there, I have a podcast uh, called The Secret Life of Death, and that's partly where some of the information for this presentation came from. I work on all kinds of research projects having to do with not just uh, not just my work as an archaeologist, but uh, one of the, one of my side interests are cemeteries, historic cemeteries, and. Lucky for me, there's one that isn't very far away from my house. And so that that was sort of the jumping off point for this presentation. And um, I, I don't have a podcast about this particular topic yet, but I do have others about other cemeteries. So this one is, this presentation is called The Rusts, The Slades, and The Burrows. And this is a study of what a small historic cemetery can teach us about early Anglo-American communities in New Hampshire. And for those who don't know who the Rusts, the Slades, and the Burrows are, we're gonna, we're gonna learn about them tonight. So to begin, we'll set the stage for what was going on in New England just prior to the to the settlement that were that the Slades, the Burrows, and the Rusts were a part of. Uh, this map here, which is one of my favorites, I I, I love maps. I, I have to say that right now. Maps maps are fantastic. This one is from roughly 1750, and. What I love about this map is that you can see very distinctly where the concentration of the population of New England was at that time. And it's pretty much uh, Southern New England and on the coasts. So you can see, uh, this is back, of course, 1750. This is, this is when we were still part of England. And all of, the, all of these little uh, areas uh, that you can see outlined are the outlines of towns and uh, the, the the different colonies that would one day turn into the New England states. And the area that we're going to be talking about today is is a little farther north out away from the coast in the inlands and the uplands of New England. And so I apologize that this this is this particular uh, clip this the zoom in of this picture of this map is a little blurry, but the reason why it's important is it has a really lot, it has a lot of really important features uh, in this one section that tell a lot about basically the mindset of the English at around 1750. And what's neat about it is that our town, the town Alstead that we're going to be talking about is kind of in this, in this zone that the map refers to uh, as these this part of this double line of towns for a frontier against the Indians. And this is a really fascinating time in New England history. This is 
again, 1750 ish. This is so this is before the, the revolution. And a lot of a lot of interesting settlement patterns and things are happening in interior New England. And the fact that it, it will be important later on in the story why our town Alstead was was set up in one of these one of in this area that the English considered to be part of this frontier area as a protection against the Indians. Another area, so this is uh, zoomed out, same area again of the map, but we've zoomed out a little bit. Our town, Alstead, is going to be right around where this red block is. And I just wanted to draw the attention to this, the, the, the words a little bit up above that that says, wilderness lands of the crown not yet appropriated. So again, as I said before, this is a this this whole entire map is really a window into the mindset of the English settlers at, at around 1750. So we have these areas again where Alstead will eventually be a town that's considered the frontier, and and as such, there are a lot of uh, a lot of things going on in and around you. Oh, I forgot I have my pointer. Oh, yeah. So we have the uh, sort of the famous Fort Number Four, not very far away from where Alstead will be, and uh, right next to Walpole. What will be Walpole? There's also another fort down there, and these two areas were settled much earlier than Alstead was, and they'll and we'll find out why that was. So the English basically the English had a plan going into uh, going into the 1750s of all of the places they wanted to push their footprint further and further up into the uh, the upper uplands the inlands of New England. So one of the things that comes into play here obviously are the indigenous Abenaki who prior to the English arrival were were the inhabitants of all of this land around us here in central and the Connecticut River Valley and up into sides in New Hampshire and Vermont. As the English were starting to push that, you know, remember from the map in the beginning where we had all of those settlements all along the coast, well, they were getting really overpopulated by 1715. So they're pushing, 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 pushing farther into interior New England, trying to get places settled and uh, get a foothold. And it's, it's partly, uh, partly political and partly military what's going on here. And by 17, by the 1750s, there had been a lot of interactions, exchanges, fights, and wars between the English and the indigenous Abenaki and also the French who were coming in from Canada. And by 1750s, the, the Abenaki had really had it basically with the English. They had set up all these treaties over the years that they had never, uh, the English were not very interested in, um, in going along with what they had, had agreed to. It. And so a lot of, a lot of things had uh, the, the trees had been gone back on and uh, they, they were having constant problems in all of these uh, settlement areas. And so these frontier areas, uh, which we were talking about what Alstead will become, were hot spots for a lot of activity between uh, confrontations between the English and, and the Abenaki and the other indigenous people of the area. So they set up a conference in 1752 and the chief Atiwanato basically spelled it out pretty clearly for the English that at that point they were not allowing them, they were not interested in selling them any more land in the interior part of New England. They had been tolerated by previous generations, but uh, they were putting their foot down and they were told very clearly that they were to, all of their settlements were to stay towards the coast and they weren't uh, where their settlements had been in 1750 that was where they were to stop. And they were, they said, spelled it out that they were expressly forbid to kill a single beaver or take a stick of timber off of the lands that we, meaning the, uh, the Abenaki, the indigenous people inhabit. If you want the timber, we'll sell you some, but you will not take it without our permission. So that's 1752, how long does this treaty last? Well, the French and Indian War starts two years later in 1754 and runs till 1763. 
uh, after after the end of the French and Indian War, the the indigenous people were still in this area and they were still coming back to the to this area, but it was a that was more infrequent and they were spending their time farther and farther north in New England and in Canada. So with that in mind, 1763 is the end of the French and Indian War, and it's the very the same year that our town ousted is established and settled. The first settlers start showing up here within 1763, 1764. So it didn't take them very long to to get the to get the population, the English population moving again. And so I've highlighted in this red, this uh, this little red rectangle here, the area that are um, the people we were talking about, the Slades, the Rusts, and the Burrows, where they uh, came in and set up their, uh, their community initially. And the interesting thing about this map right here is that you can see that this is settled, this is very rocky terrain. It's not, not where I would probably want to, to put up uh, a settlement. I would probably, you'd think that they would want to be closer to the rivers and to places that had good farmland and access to water, water and things like that for transportation. But this is still 1763. It's very, it's very close to the end of the hostilities of the French and Indian War still. And a lot of these people have a remember very clearly what went on a lot of raids a lot of fighting and again especially because this area in uh in new england was part of that that barrier that quote unquote frontier against the indians this would be the most likely spot where if there were to be any dust ups uh in activity again between the english and the french or the english and uh the indigenous people these frontier towns were will, would be where that would be most likely to happen so it was far more common for people to set up these early settlements way up in the uplands, up in the hills. And, uh, and so that's why they're not settled down closer to, to the river, like in Walpole and in Charlestown, like those settlements were. So what's interesting when we start talking about this early Anglo-American settlement pattern. It's, they go by a very distinctive, very English uh, evolution of, of how these towns get settled and established. So this is a picture of, of a, what an early settlement might have looked like. You have individuals coming up uh, in groups and interrelated families coming up to, wil to wilderness. This is, this is virgin forest in these areas. You can see in this depiction mature trees. And it's really all handwork that they have to do. Uh, they have to clear all this land. They have to build a little log cabin. And this particular guy, he's kind of lucky because he actually has, looks like he has a, a pair of oxen to help him and, and maybe even a wife. So let's, let's say that he's been here for a few years, uh, for a long time, for, for many of these people initially, it would just be the a couple of of men coming up from a, a more established settlement and they would work on these these uh on their little home homesteads for a couple of years before before they would bring their wives or other people or even livestock along with them and as it changes over time of course they're going to be clearing more land so let's say this is maybe 20 years later and they still have a small little cabin um and maybe maybe some they've got some workers still mostly uh mostly forested around them but they've done a lot of clearing and they're opening up farm pastures out back and adding fences and putting in a lot of infrastructure a little bridge there and then as time moves on we we still see uh we still see a lot of improvements going on so there's the remnant of our maybe the the early cabin here but they've built on a nicer larger house onto the side of that they've started to open up uh quite a swath of of other farmland out behind their house they're growing crops there's a barn even planted an orchard they've got neighbors out back so these these uh these improvements are slowly are slowly taking hold as more and more people of course are coming to these areas as they're getting uh, as they're getting settled and developed and then sort of the, the the pinnacle of new inner upper new england farm life we've got 
pretty much the entire land out behind this old farm cleared off. There's even a little train going by. The farmhouse itself has, we don't even see what that little, that little, uh, the little cube of the original uh, log cabin, you don't even see that anymore. They've added all sorts of embellishments to it and they have quite an expansive farm. And so probably around the turn, you know, this is about 1850-ish that this was, uh, that this was published, but you can see this happening over and over and over again. And every little town in New England has the same evolution of when the earlier people come here and how, how the, the population spreads out and expands and improves, quote unquote, improves uh, the land landscape. So as far as our settlement here in Alsted, who are the people, uh, who are the boroughs, the, the Slades, and the Rusts? Who are these people and why are they coming here? Well, this, this old map here, it comes from uh, a 1910 history of the area. And this, this red dot here is where our cemetery that we're going to be talking about is that they've established and you can see uh, a whole uh, a whole bunch of people have settled this area so this is uh, this is the neighborhood that the rusts the slades and the burrows uh, all established in just uh, just to the east or sorry to the west of what is Alsted center so kind of right in between Alsted and Walpole we have the rusts settling up in this area here we have the Burrow fam Burroughs family a little bit farther to the south and the Slades a little bit south, st farther still. And what's interesting about, about this, again, I said French and Indian War is over by 1763. Uh, the town of Alsted is chartered that same year. And we've got people coming here pretty much right away. By 1767, the population is 130 people and that, that's, that's a pretty significant amount. That's you know, maybe 15 families. And this is talking about throughout the entire town, but that's that's still a lot of a lot of people on the move and a lot of people working, doing all of those, uh, doing all those projects of clearing land and setting up their farmsteads all throughout the landscape here. We have the boroughs showing up in 1766. So pretty, very early on they're, they're coming and they are established. Uh, this, the Rusts uh, family comes a year later. The Kingsberries as well, not too long after that. The Slades, the Cranes, the Hills, Thompsons and the Roots. And these aren't all of the families that lived in this neighborhood. They're just, uh, just ones that, um, that I was able to find actual dates for when they they supposedly came and settled in in our neighborhood here, and these people are all from central uh, southern central Connecticut, so they all knew each other before they came to uh, they came up to New Hampshire. And by 1776, the population of our little neighborhood has gotten uh, has gotten so large that a number of the inhabitants decided that they needed their own cemetery. And so as part of that, uh, they, they sort of took it upon themselves to establish their own cemetery. And Nathaniel Rust was paid 20 shillings to purchase a piece of land for this community cemetery. And the people who bought into that cemetery were the Burroughs, the Slades, the Crane family, the Thompsons, uh, the Hills, a number of John Burroughs children, and Nathaniel, uh, and also a, a child, uh, one of the children of John Slade, and Nathaniel Rust himself, who owned the piece of property. And as the, the deed goes, they, they cut off a quarter, or he set aside a quarter acre, and this is where some of the interesting stuff starts to, we start to learn, learn a little bit about the, the local and regional history in, uh, in this little excerpt here from, uh, from the deed, talking about a road. Uh, this, this, this little piece of land that will become the cemetery starts on the road leading from Walpole to Marlow. At the corner of the fence as it now stands, westerly of my dwelling house, we're talking about uh, Nathaniel Rust, his dwelling house, then running northerly seven rods to a stake, westerly six rods to a stake, cellar, southerly to the said road and a stake, and easterly to said road. And I don't know about 
about anybody else who's ever tried to to figure out the, the language of old of uh of old deed information but sometimes it can be just i mean here we actually have them talking about rods and you know that that's can be a little confusing um and they're talking about stakes and sometimes it's even just oh a tree so it's it can be hard to orient yourself sometimes to this old deed information and i don't know if they intentionally make it a little vague but it, sometimes it's it's a little hard to understand exactly uh to place things exactly especially the old ones so in the in the deed itself, Rust references his home. And though this isn't the original home that he was talking about from the, the research that I've done, um, this, this house was one built by Ira and Laura Rust, who were, uh, Ira was the grandson of Nathaniel Rust. And he built this house supposedly, if not on the site of the original family cabin, at least in the general vicinity of that cabin. And this, this particular house was built in 1828 by, by Ira, his, his grandson. And it's no longer standing anymore, but, but it's a great reference uh, for us to try to, to try to orient ourselves in that deed language. So we know he was talking about this cemetery being situated um, on a road that went, that ran westerly of his house. And so we can kind of have dealing with some old maps. This one is from 1856. So it's a little beyond what we're talking about in 1776, but some of the landmarks still hold so that, that can help uh, help orient us a little bit. So here's our cemetery that they're talking about. And as you'll notice, there's it was there's no road that goes right by it, as the deed says that it very specifically references this road re leading from Walpole to Marlow. And this this cemetery is pretty much out in the middle middle of a field from the looks of it from this old map. But we can get some clues based on this house right here. Doing a little research into the history of this house, here in 1856, it's owned by a man named uh, Chandler Cannon, but this is where I believe that that brick house that we saw that Ira Rust had built actually stands, uh, or actually stood rather, sorry. So if we, uh, so again, if we follow the, the language, the, the language of the deed here talking about where his house now stands. So if, if this is where the house was at the time in 1776 or thereabouts, there must have been a road that went past that. And the, the cemetery itself is bounded to the south and to the east by this road. So if we can kind of, uh, this is just conjecture on my part, but uh, we can, sort of figure out a little bit maybe where that road came by the house and then came out into the into the field what is, what is a field now and around the side of the cemetery and then where it went from there it's a little hard to tell but uh, I've always thought that this this little curve in the road it's kind of a weird uh, a weird angle to have uh, sort of this 90 degree angle right in the middle of along this road when the the rest of the road looks pretty straight so logically you'd think that it might just continue down like that and this this addition maybe this part this is what is pratt road now maybe this was an addition sometime later that uh, that there was so, or maybe there was some connection from this part of the road to over here that um that oriented or, or that that placed that that cemetery there and Right now, there's not a lot of stuff around here anymore, but this presumably, if they put a cemetery here, this was probably more or less the, the center of, or at least close to the center of their little neighborhood. So this would have been in and around all of those, fam where all those families that we we're talking about were living at the time. So it would make sense. And, and as populations changed and as people moved away and, and different areas grew up, maybe this particular area became less centrally located and then the road was moved. 
So the cemetery itself is is a really uh, it's really lovely and it's a lot of fun to I love going out and looking at cemeteries and this one this one's got it all let me tell you. Um, <laughs> It's it's a nice it's it's located as we said out in in a field right now, but it's got a beautiful stone wall that goes all the way around it, and it's got a really nice mix of what you would expect to find in a turn of the century, turn of the 18th century. Uh, some New England cemetery. So we've got a variety of different stone types. We've got the slate kind of stones. We've got marble stones. And because of the nature of the weather in New England, the stones are in various stages of preservation. Uh, for the most part, everything's in pretty good shape. We do have, have a few that are broken and in need of some attention and some older ones that have had some previous repairs done to them as well. But that's that's all pretty typical, especially in in these older type cemeteries where you have a lot of, as you can see, this one's leaning up against a very large tree where you have trees. Um, the a lot of times that's where a lot of your damage comes from or from these old trees as they break and fall. They oftentimes will damage these these old stones in the process. So I was really interested in finding out how how intact the the cemetery itself was and seeing what we could what we could discern about who was interred there and and take an inventory of the stones and just just basically get a catalog and of of the status of preservation for the most part of what what was existing in the cemetery so in october in 2019 i had a friend of mine this is garrett evans and he's an archaeologist just like me and he also has the added the added uh, we have the added benefit of his knowledge of mapping and engineer uh, uh, not engineering but um, he's he run he can do uh, surveying and so this machine here is a piece of his survey equipment that takes digital points uh, for our, anything that you want. And he takes all of that information in and can make these really fantastic maps with them. And so we went around the cemetery and you take, uh, take this rod that has a prism on it. So this, this uh, his total station here is what this machine is called. It's gonna be able to shoot shoot these uh, these beams, these lasers that reflect off and give him distance and location. And he takes all of that information and puts it on, puts it down in his uh, in his computer program and can generate these maps. And Ben right here, so he's giving him the points here, but he's also giving him measurements of the some or of the gravestones as well. So we're getting the location, we're getting approximate sizes of these summit uh, of these gravestones. And, oops, and that all becomes really important when we start to, like I said, he's, Garrett's going to take all that information and generate some really neat, re really neat maps, which we'll look at in a minute. And what I was lucky enough to find was that somebody had basically already done this, uh, the same thing about a hundred years ago. So uh, a family member, a descendant of William Slade, one of the, the families we've been talking about, at the turn of about eight, uh, 1910, did this tremendous family history about the Slade family and all of the other, and consequently all the other families in our neighborhood up here in Alstead, and put together uh, this this wonderful book that is, if you're interested, it's available online. It's been digitized. Uh, if you just go to this uh, website archive.org, and you can look up the book William Slade. Um, of Windsor, Connecticut and his descendants by Thomas Bellows Peck and have access to it. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous resource. And so he, he compiled a lot of the information from family history. So it's a lot of genealogies and, uh, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of other early histories that he had, um, that he himself, uh, Thomas Bellows Peck had also um, compiled in this book. And what we find is this really lovely layout of his his inventory of the burials it at this cemetery at the Rust Cemetery at around 1910, and he 
he wrote them all down. He wrote down all the inscriptions, which is wonderful for us nowadays because even though the the stones are still there and you can um, you can you can see them, sometimes they're very difficult to read uh, because of this the the deterioration, especially of of the the marble stones. They can be very difficult to read because they're so degraded at this point. But all of a hundred years ago, or more than a hundred years ago, he he wrote all of that information down, and so. What we were, ex we were really excited to see that based on his inventory, there were 33 stones uh, commemorating 34 burials. And we, we found the same number there. So over the past hundred years, we, there haven't been any, any uh, gravestones, any gravestones lost. So that was really nice to be able to, to account for all of them. And so, so taking all that information that I got from Garrett, so we were, not only locating the, the spots uh, where all of these graves were, but we're compiling that and synthesizing that with the information that we got from not only the gravestones themselves, but from this early history that has all the names and the dates. And we're combining those two together. And when you do that, we, we, get, we get to study the demographics of the area. So we're looking at not just who's living in the neighborhood, but you're seeing the breakdown of the population as far as age and males and females and uh, whether there are you know, different influxes of people, people coming and going and disease outbreaks and, and even in-depth family relationships can all be uh, really augmented by the efficient use of the data that these maps that Garrett uh, produced for us. So this is an example of one of the maps, and I apologize, it's a little blurry. It's, it's a screenshot that I took here, but this is the, the basic outline of what the map, one of the maps that he created for the, the cemetery looks like. <clears throat> so this one is based on the dates of interment. So we broke, we broke down by five year increments up until uh, we broke it off at 1859, um, and then there was one more interment in the 1970s, uh, but the, the majority of them uh, beginning from at least at least the, the known record from 1785, that's the, the first, it's probably not the first interment here, but it's the one where we have the, the earliest stone, uh, stone a burial with a stone rather, uh, dates from 1785, so we just started there. And the cool thing about the way that these maps work is that you can, each, each one of these groupings of, of eras of, time, of these five-year periods are a different layer on the map. So you can turn a layer on or turn a layer off. And it really makes it, it, makes it fun and easy to start seeing how different, uh, to start seeing trends and when, where people are being buried, when they're being buried, what parts of the cemetery are being used at different periods. Maybe that doesn't sound very interesting to some of you, but it does to a very sad few of us. But, uh, and so some of the other features, so you'll see that he's got it outlined in the stone wall. So that's what these, uh, if it's hard to read the key here, so these little, these little round bubbles are the, the stone wall. Uh, these different, these different pieces are, are these different signs are just the trees, existing trees that are, or stumps in, in some of the cases, trees and stumps. And then we have, I'll go into here. So then we actually have areas where we have individual burials. And so we have a headstone and a footstone and a number that correlates to a, a list that I, that I put together of the individual. So you can uh, turn on, for instance, this is an example of, I, I turned on the layer for 1785 to 1789. We have three interments recorded and they all happen to be in the same little area up here. And so we can look and see that they were Anna Burroughs, Linda Burroughs and Prudence Rust. And so they were presumably all put in the same area at the same time because that's perhaps when that, that area of the cemetery was being utilized at that time. 
And so as we, so you can, so basically what I did is I went through and individually turned on each one of those uh, five year increment layers. And it was really easy to see where the burials were and to record them. And so this is just a breakdown by those five year periods of, of how many burials that we're seeing going on at that time. And, uh, and so you can start to see some trends again, uh, sometimes where there were a lot of burials as, be, as in the uh, 1810 to 1814. And then we have a whole period over here where there were no burials. So that sort of asks, leads to the questions of, well, what was going on at those times? So this is just a spreadsheet of basically the same kind of information that we were seeing on the map, just in a spreadsheet form. And we've got those five-year increments here and listed, listed, on, uh, listed over here are all the different individual burials and the people's names during, that they were buried during those time periods. So we have, as I mentioned before, the 1810 to 1814, that was the highest, uh, the highest amount of burials. That was eight, which was a pretty significant number of burials overall. And What's interesting about that is when you pull away from um, and you look at things that are happening, not just in that town, but also regionally and uh, and within New England itself, this sort of fits into a pattern we see that we see in uh, New England at large at this time. We see a lot of uh, a lot of other towns reporting high numbers of burials during this same period and as I mentioned before, then we have, of course, on the other end of that, these era, eras where there's no burials being reported. And so what does, what does that interpretation lead us to? Well, uh, as a, the, for the most part, over the roughly 75 year period that this cemetery was being used, at least based on uh, the known uh, burials that have dates on them, these, this, this little enclave, this little neighborhood averaged about 2.3 deaths within that community every five years. With the exception being the 1810 to 1814 time period, where we had the high of eight deaths. And again, this is interesting because it coincides with the not only the highest neighborhood population at that time, but it also but that also correlates to these regional waves of epidemic diseases that were sweeping through New England at that very time. And there's there are like as I said, you can go through a, most of the town histories in this area, all up and down the Connecticut River Valley, all the way up into southern Canada. And they were all having this similar type of experience where you're having a lot of people moving around, a lot of population explosion in, in these towns and these settlements. And also what was bringing, uh, they were bringing with them disease as they were doing this. How prescient is that <laughs> in this days of COVID-19? So, uh, so that, that sort of makes sense and it all ties in what, what's happening uh, regionally and historically, which is really, which is really fascinating. Um, and I mentioned again that there was this whole time period, the 1840s to 1854, where they had no reported deaths or no reported burials in this, uh, in this particular cemetery in the Rust Cemetery. And again, when you pull away, initially that seems like a, a pretty significant thing, but when you pull away, we find out that they, the, this, the same community had also set up a new cemetery around 1826. So most of the new, the, the, the deaths that happened from about 1826 on, some of them were being put in the Rust Cemetery, but a lot of them were being put in this uh, other cemetery that was located just at the, the other end of the road. So it doesn't necessarily mean that fewer people were dying or nobody was dying within this community. It just means that those people were being buried elsewhere. And another thing to take into account is that because, uh, because not all of the burials here were, were marked, uh, there's a number of unmarked graves in this, in this cemetery that these these details aren't a hundred percent accurate, and they never could be. So we we don't have uh, we don't know for sure exactly how many people are buried in that cemetery, and so it makes the 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 
data interpretation, a little bit sketchy, but based on what we do have, some of this stuff is, is pretty interesting. Uh, another thing that I was able to do is I really wanted to look at the the family groups because we talked about all of these the, the, these people uh, these groups this group of people at the very beginning all knowing each other uh, coming from southern Connecticut they were they all knew each other from there and they all moved up moved up here and established the the settlement in Alstead and so it's just it's it's very it's a it's an interesting way to study people is to study their their family relationships. And so we had Garrett make us another map. Here I am using my hand. You can't see what I'm doing, so I should, I should use uh, the pointer here. So as opposed to the, the one we used before, which was just dealing strictly with the dates of interments of the, of the cemetery, this one is going by the, the family relationships. And so that again, because we set this up so that you can have each one of these groups a different layer on the map, you can turn different layers on and different layers off to see how the family groups, uh, you can see where they, where they show up on the cemetery. So here I have a side by side uh, comparison of the, of, for example, the burrows layer. So on this side, we have the the burrows layer turned off. There's no burials that show up, but we turn the burrows layer on and you can see that there are two very distinct groups of burrows family members that are using these two areas at the cemetery at very different times. So this, this doesn't take into account time. This is just based on family relationships. And this is sort of what you would expect to see, um, family members being buried in and around each other over time. And so this is uh, just a, a close up of one of those one of those sections of the the relationship of the Burroughs family. So again, uh, we've got a headstone here, a footstone here, same thing. And so they're they're pretty much all stacked up one next to each other, right, all right next to each other in these little clusters. Uh, this this is all a, 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 an extended related family. And so we're back to the <laughs> very exciting spreadsheet here. Uh, so we can also, again, just looking at the this data a little bit differently in the spreadsheet form, we can see some specific things that are going on within families. We can, if we look at family connections and relationships and compare to when they died, you can start to learn a little bit more of a personal story about these people. So within the Burroughs family themselves, uh, we have Sarah, Sarah Burroughs and John Burroughs, husband and wife, dying uh, a year apart. So that's 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 pretty significant. And we can see that uh, that Martha Slade and John Slade, husband and wife, also dying within a few years of each other themselves. So that's a, a, a tremendous hardship you can imagine for a family to to lose a number of their. Uh, of their their elders so in such close succession succession and sort of on the flip side of that looking at the Hale family here we have Richard and John Hale uh, just just young children dying in, in within the same household dying a year apart or more or less a year apart so again a, another you can imagine another tremendous hardship within those families to lose uh, to lose at least two children that we know of within a year of each other that's pretty pretty dramatic and so if we if we stay talking about the family connections uh, uh, just a little bit longer i just wanted to point out a few things that if if we were to just look at the data and the information on the gravestone itself, we would see, we would see a number of connections and relationships. Obviously, everybody with the last name Burroughs, you would expect them to be related. Everybody with the last name Rust, sure, there there's got to be some connection there. The same thing with the Slades. Uh, but one of the things that I was able to really really get sink my teeth into and was a lot of very interesting and a lot of fun was when we expanded the family uh the families out and started to look at the 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 in-laws so not just the the people who share the same name but started to look at the the in-laws that you see 
a lot of these this this neighborhood had a much more intricate interfamily connection that even than even initially appears to be so the remember at the beginning we were talking about the the individuals who bought into this the the rust cemetery itself right from the beginning the rust family the burrows the slades the thompsons the hills the cranes these were some of the earliest settlers to this neighborhood and they set up the cemetery there um, for their growing families within that we have these these the the first generation settlers there so we have john slade john burroughs job thompson and lemuel crane and their wives martha sarah rhoda and mrs crane she didn't have a name i guess but uh, i wasn't able to find what mrs crane's uh, first name was unfortunately but when you get again when we start to look at the the wives start to factor take take more into account how the connection of the the extended family and how the wives played into it not just the husbands you can see that they're way more intricately connected than we first appeared so the slades and the burrows are connected because sisters Martha Aby and Sarah Aby married John Slade and John Burroughs. So there's our there's our initial connection there from this uh, from the first generation of of settlers. The same thing, so a similar sort of thing between the Thompsons and the Cranes. Uh, Mrs. Thompson's maiden name was Crane, so most likely she was Lemuel Crane's sister. So we have these this first generation of people that grew up in Connecticut, they married in Connecticut, had children in Connecticut, and their children came of age in Connecticut. They were the first one to intermarry intricately and establish these family connections. These, so then the first generation with the, the or excuse me, the second generation, uh, their children, they married in Connect they marry in Connecticut or New Hampshire. They move to Alstead from Connecticut with their families, with their mothers and their fathers, the this first generation. They move to Alstead. They bring their children, their adult children along. And their adult children start having children in in this new settlement, in and among this new neighborhood, which is in part why it grows so rapidly, because they're having a lot of kids all at the same time. And once they're here in Alsted, they continue that tradition of, of marrying into these families. So we have this whole neighborhood that's established, uh, established up here in New Hampshire in Alsted that's just being reinforced by even more family marriages. So you have Burroughs and Rusts marrying and Thompsons and Slades intermarrying. Uh, pretty extensively, and and that's pretty common. You you see that in most of these early settlements, where again, there's not a lot of options for one thing. There's <laughs> you you do see cousins and such marrying each other. It's it's not as bad as it sounds, but uh, there these these people forged these very close relationships, very tight familial relationships and then once they moved up here it, it becomes even more solidified for a couple generations and and then of course that brings us to uh to you know maybe the 1820s 1830s or so and then things start to happen in and around not just new hampshire not just alsted but new england in general a lot of people start moving away at that point and so these these very uh, centralized cores of interrelated intermarried families start to sort of dissipate a little bit after one or two generations after there's uh they, there's no they don't need need that sort of uh that sort of basis that sort of base anymore necessarily there, there's more infrastructure of the town to help to help uh just to help with their daily lives they don't necessarily need the to, to rely on, strictly on their family at that point. There's more uh, town infrastructure, there's more state infrastructure, national infrastructure that's starting to, to take the place of, of some of those uh, needs, those immediate family, uh, the needs that the family would provide. And something else that the maps 
uh, that that they were really good for. Again, I, I had mentioned earlier that that part of the the data set that I was working with isn't complete can't keep, be considered completely accurate because we just don't have uh, every single burial in the Rust Cemetery recorded. There's not a stone for everybody, so it's it's hard to know exactly what the demographics are, uh, the, the data shows us. But one of the great things about this mapping project that we did with Garrett was that there are things that you can see when you're out there on, the sea, uh, on site that don't necessarily show up very well in pictures. And, and this is one of the things that's kind of hard to show. It, it barely shows. But this is uh, the western part of the of the cemetery, and you can almost see it when the lighting is right. When you're out there, it's very obvious. But in photos, it just doesn't show up nearly as well. You can kind of see that there are these these lines where are these troughs and furrows, and you can see there's a stone there, there's a stone there, and and they're all kind of lined up next to each other. So this this would indicate that they these are some examples of areas where there are unmarked graves that um, that are part of the all over uh, as well as we'll see uh, they're they're kind of all over the cemetery different ones like this and so what we did when we were out there is we marked the these th these show us where there are either mounds or divots, like these linear, pretty obvious linear mounds or divots. And so like, as I showed you in the picture, some of them have just field stones as a headstone and a footstone, uh, possibly. And this shows up really nicely on a map. And when we look at this compared to all of the clusters of the known burials that have headstones, it's pretty obvious where that they are that they're separated, that they're not really, for the most part, not really mixed in with one another. There are areas that have um, that have the burials with the headstones, and then there are other areas that have unmarked burials in them. And that's not to say that each one of these is definitely uh, definitely a burial, but it it just it's interesting to notice, and it and it bears uh, it, it's it's worth putting on a map just to see how it lays out. Um, and again, some of these have have field stones, whether those were ones that somebody years ago put on, or whether that was the original type of stone that was used on there. It's hard to say. Um, but we're at the moment I'm working on trying to to put together an, an inventory of people who may have been buried here that were in, in unmarked graves so that we might have an idea of some of the other individuals that are uh, that are present buried here. But just just a rough count, uh, there's at least a dozen of these linear mounds uh, all over the cemetery, maybe even, you know, more than a dozen. So it's, it might even add another, you know, 10 or 15 burials to the, to the total that we do know of, which is pretty, pretty significant and, and not uncommon. You, you see this all the time in these early cemeteries where people were either didn't necessarily have the money at the time to buy a gravestone that was fairly common uh, and they would have just marked it with a field stone something that they just pulled out of the field or as they were digging the grave they would have pulled that up and, and placed it there as a marker or they had intended to to come back and a lot of times gravestones were added years and years later that was also very common and perhaps that particular family had died off or moved away before they could actually put the headstone there. And then the other op option, of course, is that there was a headstone there and that it had since broken and has been removed. Um, but what's what's good to know about that uh, in, in that that idea is that because of the work done by that really early survey in 1910, we know at least from at least over the past hundred years or so, we haven't lost any more gravestones since then. So if, if there were other markers and other gravestones that had inscriptions on them, they were lost before, must have been lost before at least uh, 1910. So the, the preservation at, this, at the cemetery right now is, is generally pretty good. So for the most, that's, that's pretty much what I have for my presentation this evening. If, if you enjoyed what I was talking about and are interested in some of my other work, 
Jenna mentioned that I have the podcast that's called The Secret Life of Death. You can find that episodes on this uh, by going to my website right there. It's also available on all of the general podcast platforms out there. You just have to search for it. And it was, uh, we'll be putting out new episodes um, pretty soon. I'm still, it takes a while to produce them. So they're, they, they come out every couple of months or so, but uh, I'm working on a series right now. So that will be coming out hopefully by the end of the winter. So thank everybody for showing up tonight. Thank you to the Historical Society of Cheshire County, uh, Jenna Carroll, Andrea Cheney for being so wonderful and open to my idea of doing a presentation and, and helping me get everything set up. Of course, to Garrett Evans, who was the who worked his magic making all of those beautiful maps and spending time with us doing the survey. It was really cool. My friend Kate, who came out with me and helped me take photos and look around and and do some to do some extra survey work to my husband, Floyd, and my dog. My husband, Floyd, oh my God, my husband, Ben. My dog, Floyd, uh, and my cats, Ginny Friney Higgins. They were here helping me all along and I couldn't have done it without them for sure because as you can see those uh, paper bags and the uh, all of the, the uh, wrapping paper does not rip itself. They've, they've worked hard on their work and I, and it was a, a pleasure being here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, let me just say we have a crowd that is in love with maps and spreadsheets. So <laughs> I appreciate. Oh, well, we'll, let's see, we can go us. back. Uh, so what I can do um, is start feeding you some questions that have come in. That sounds good to you. Okay. Um, so one question was, did these families maybe know each other before they moved to Connecticut? Is it possible that these are families that could have known each other in Europe? That I, I don't, I don't know that for sure. From what I, I understand of their families that they had been in Connecticut for a number of generations, um, whether they knew each other, you know, we're talking like, you know, 1650s or something like that. They, these are early, early settlers um, from, 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 it, well, mostly England. And um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, let's see, the next one I have, oh, somebody had asked about who was buried in the 1970s, but it looks like we got that answer in the chat as well. Um, did the population decline in hill towns after 1830 or so affect um, this work uh, was another question, um, but I believe you did talk about that as well. Um, what about unmarked graves? There's a question about whether or not these could be graves of, of servants or enslaved people. It's entirely possible. Um, I don't know how many, you know, servants, the, a lot of these families, they may have had like indentured servants. None of them were wealthy, uh, wealthy enough to have like an estate in that sense, but they certainly, they certainly could be some examples of that. And it would be, uh, that's one of the things of, when we're talking about unmarked graves you really you have to consider whether there there were other people that just you know um people who black people or indigenous people who do, people who have a don't necessarily always make it into the written history that's to say that they that there weren't uh people living in in the towns that had um that had, like I said, indentured servants, but that it could also be, you know, workers like um, that who who happened to be who were black or who were indigenous people who were still living in the area. That's that's one of the interesting things that I think cemetery sciences are starting to scientists are really starting to explore that now. That just relying on this traditional, very Anglo, very white history that is based on a lot of uh, 
the, the the histories that we work off of are based on histories that were done at the you know at the turn of the century which very flagrantly left out a lot of things about immigrants and about uh, about all other social groups other than um, the the hallowed founding fathers kind of thing. So I wouldn't be surprised that would be that would be kind of that would be a really neat thing to 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 look into and I and I've just started going into the process of trying to figure out who might be in these unmarked graves. It's it's a hard it's hard to do, but um, that's that's just in the in the beginning of it. But that's one of the things I would love to find out about. Great. Um, I'm gonna take a question from somebody who raised their hand, uh, Kathleen. My question is in the grave sites and you, in the data you showed us, there weren't any, there were no deaths between 19 or in the 19th century, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, this, this particular grave, this, the Rust Graveyard uh, Cemetery was really only used between uh, 1776 and about a, about I think the last one was 1856 but that was just a single burial and there hadn't been many for a number of years and I think that's just because it was full at that point there really there weren't there wasn't room for for more burials and at in 1826 the same uh the same group the same community neighborhood set up another cemetery so there's a there's another cemetery called the Slade Cemetery that has a lot of these same families and these same people, but it's just later. And mm -hmm. that's where a lot of, of those. And then when that one got full, then there's a, a third cemetery that's it's on the other end of the road. And so then a lot of the, the people from that neighborhood from the, you know, maybe the 1870s on show up. Uh, show up in that other cemetery. So it's not that people are necessarily, again, like not that they're not dying and not that there aren't people there. They're just hopscotching to different cemeteries in the in the area. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, let's, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A section. Um, was there a church that played a part in the community or in the cemetery in particular? Not that I could find. It's it's kind of a fun. Let's see if I can find my uh, slide here. That's what was uh, interesting about this this little enclave was that it was sort of a. Th it seemed like it was a, a thing unto itself. Sorry if I'm giving anybody whiplash here, um, because there was. Uh, I think in the way. Sorry, I gotta just move my cursor here. So the this this little neighborhood oh they can't see me here. There we go. So this this neighborhood that the Rust, the Burroughs, the Slades, and, and some of these other people set up and developed was was centered in and around this area. But the actual town, the actual center of um, at the same at this time was Alsted Center at the other end of this road here. And this is where they had a, a closer down to here, they had a church. A meeting house kind of thing and then the other cemetery is is over here too at the end of this road so there was another population center out here that all of that took place um and uh, took excuse me took place on and um what was sort of as a side note with some of the other research that i've done in in and around this area that seems again that seems to be kind of this common theme is that there's, there was also this other little, uh, this other little enclave down here, um, in and around this, uh, the the Dodge Tavern, the Griswold Tavern here, and another set of, of families that were, all again, all related, all came from the same area, all all intermarried. They had a, you know, maybe a half a dozen houses or so in this spot over here too, and and eventually they they started to. You know, it's not like none of them mixed and they didn't know each other. Obviously, everybody did, but that just seems to be the trend that I, that happened in and around this time. That there were a lot of these families coming from other places elsewhere in uh, not just Connecticut but other you know, other places in Massachusetts, um, all knowing each other in their original towns, 
transplanting up to these new settlements and uh, in establishing little enclaves uh, unto themselves for a little while too. So that's that that's sort of what was kind of interesting to me again about the cemetery is that that's one of the most visual things uh, left behind by all of these other um, by this particular group of people that the, uh, that these other little enclaves that I looked at didn't necessarily have, so. Um, we have a, a comment, fascinating presentation. It's interesting to learn that my fourth grandmother, Elizabeth Burroughs, may have died during a pandemic. Oh, this, oh. This is Terry Clark. I visited and um, mapped the cemetery myself in 2011. Thank you. According to my genealogical research, the Slades and Burroughs go back to the mid 1600s in w Windsor. So they're there quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you put information on uh, other websites like uh, Find a Grave? I don't necessarily, I mean, for the most part, they're pretty up to date and accurate. Uh, I, I utilize find a grave quite, <laughs> quite a bit for uh, for for research and um, and just as uh, to check references and things like that. But um, I don't add anything to them. I I've you have to I think you have to have a special clearance, you know, to to post things and to make comments and stuff. And I've never I've never done that for to for find a grave. Okay. Um, one more question, and then I'll go to somebody else who raised a hand. Uh, the Na Hampshire Old Graveyard Association Index for Alstead has seven named cemeteries, but no rust. If you well, that, index, um, they'd love to add it. It's it's um, this. I think they call it the Trail Yard Cemetery in some of the older older publications, or. It's also, see, it's also very confusing because like, as you can see right here, this cemetery, they call it the John Slade Cemetery. So at the turn of the century, they were calling this the John Slade Cemetery. And then this, let's see, then this other cemetery is also the Slade Cemetery. So it's, but they're two separate cemeteries. So it gets very confusing. Um, and then I, I'm not sure when they changed it to the Rust or the Trail Yard Cemetery, but sometime in the I think sometime within you know maybe since the 60s or something like that they changed they might have changed the names okay uh we have Margaret on the line Margaret you can unmute yes um you talking Margaret Perry hi yeah. Margaret how are you hi. I'm well thank you <laughs> nice good um, my question is, is there any way that one could see that map that you showed, not the one we're looking at right now, uh, I think it was 1750 perhaps, that the, showed... Oh, the really... I think it was the first... All of my little doodads, that one? Uh, no. That'd be nice too. I'd love to see that. <laughs> well, if if you wanted to look, this one is available um, for anybody who's interested in maps. <laughs> this is uh, this I got off of um, the Library of Congress website. So okay. if you you can just put in the name, um, the Bowles map of the seat of war in New England. To bring that up, but maybe you mean uh, again. Sorry, if this is. <laughs> we're just reliving it all the highlights everybody can this one that one that one okay what's that this one is from it's the map of cheshire county also from the library of congress um from 1856 1856 yes i thought it was 58 well some of them are 56 and some of them are 58 depending on the publication i think there's two separate uh two separate publications from that for some reason and okay. well that's, uh, or that's versions and they, rather. Can't, they can't be too different no i wouldn't imagine so so i have the 1858 so oh, okay so i'm all set with that then okay study it more is the answer <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thanks, thanks um next question so you're you're doing okay oh sure <laughs> Okay. Um, 
how did the original families obtain their land to settle in Alstead? Did they pay for it or were their plots of land all the same acreage? No, it seems to be, kind of be all over the place. Um, from what I could gather, the the majority of this section of Alstead where where this this community began was owned um, or not oh, well yeah owned uh, by uh, a man named Chase who lived up in Cornish, New Hampshire at the time. And, and the way these, I, 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 if you, if you already know how this, this is, I apologize, but the, the English at the time set up this, this system called the proprietorship system. And it was a way of getting, uh, really encourage, trying to encourage people to get land settled. And so within a particular community, um, the, the, the crown would give these, you know, enormous chunks of land, um, to these companies, basically, um, in, in, in pretty much every sense of the word. Um, there was no money that changed hands necessarily, but it was given to these, these companies. And it was up to this company, you had the, a, a certain num amount of time to get the charter, so to get the town uh, and specific things within the town um, set up. Otherwise, you'd lose your charter. And so they were usually this this a group of upstanding citizens within within a town or something like that in Connecticut, for instance, or uh, another big name was uh, Benjamin Bellows in this area. He was another one of these earlier proprietors who um, he was he, he was in charge. He was sort of the foreman of all of this this stuff. So he was in charge of getting people up here, getting the land, uh, getting the land settled, and they would pay him. And I think he would have to pay some of the other, you know, up up the chain a certain amount. But thousands and thousands of acres of land were were under their under their care. And but they had to get again had to get the people to come with them and settle it which include like the they always talk about the land being improved which meant it had to be cleared a certain number of acreage into into tillage and houses and numbers of people it had to be there and they'd have to have a, a some sort of governing body set up all of that kind of thing within this you know certain amount of time and for the the boroughs, the the rusts, the 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 cranes, the hill, the these people who came up, uh, they they could buy. They were sort of three or four people down on this this tier of of people owning the land and buying the land. So they could just buy, I think probably what they what they could afford. And then you see them breaking off pieces to sell to so and so, or to sell to the, or to give to their sons, and you know, because that was the, the whole the way that sort of uh, what well, what was one of the drivers <clears throat> was that in southern New England it was very overpopulated, and by the time this you know the 1760s rolled around, they had more or less they did the the primogeniture. Uh, form of breaking up property where you give not necessarily mostly give you know most of your property to your eldest son or you break up your property and give it to your to your sons uh after you after you die and so by the time the 1760s roll around this is a number of generations and so maybe your son gets a quarter of an acre so it's really not worth the their effort anymore so that's part of the reason why they're pushing so hard up into these other these uh these areas up in interior new england because you can get thousands of acres and hundreds of acres and then you can break it off for your family and and work it that way but it seems to be that they i I would just come across in some of the research a little, you know, 20 acres here, 30 acres here, but they're buying and selling stuff all the time too, which is really kind of fascinating that that was almost a currency at that time is, is land. And that was, that was really a, you know, a driving force for their economy is who had land and what you could, that, that said a lot about your social standing of how much land you had and what you could, you know, and that was at least collateral for other things too. So. Thank you. Uh, we have three raised hands now, so I'm going to go back to that. Okay. Um, let's see. Joe, you can unmute. Joe Kohler. Hey, 
Oh, I think you unmuted and went mute again. <laughs> okay. Go. Go. Okay. So I live in this area and, um, you know, we, we have some land that goes way back up on the steep hill, Slade Hill, basically. And, you know, out in the middle of nowhere are all these pretty well formed stone walls that made boundaries. Who made those and when did they make them and why did they and how the heck did they do it? <laughs> it's hard to even walk up on this land. It's so steep. It's it's amazing. There's there's a stretch uh, on ours too that it's it's rock outcrop and then there's the stone wall kind of going up over this unbelievably steep part of the you're like why even bother? But um, the from what the the stone walls were something that happened actually a, a lot later than the time period that we're taught. We meant a lot later, but um, after all of this land was cleared, so you know maybe by the 1820s, 1830s, this most of the a lot of the land around here was was being cleared off for the most part, and a big push after that was uh, when people started sheep farming. That was a huge push to probably the areas that you're talking about and up by where I am. These you know, maybe f almost 45 degree angle type hills that had been untouched before were starting to be being cleared as well uh, to make pasture land for, for sheep because people were just going nuts uh, raising sheep around here, around the 1850s or, or so. And so the, 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 the evolution of stone walls is really interesting. And uh, if you know Michael Neary, he can tell you a lot about that. He's doing a lot of work over at the at the gardens there, studying all the stone walls that he's that they've got there. And the the whole process was again the, when they first cleared the land, there were some rocks, but not as many as New England is kind of known for being the rocky kind of soil. Now, what we see as the this very rocky soil was a, a process that after all of the trees were gone, the the and the the roots of the trees kind of held all the rocks in place for the most part. So the rocks were still there, but they were just buried. They were down deeper in the ground. But once all of that cover came off and the freeze and thaw cycle starts to happen with um, with the winters and erosion, erosion was a huge problem, especially when they started to graze, graze sheep. And so as you, you know, work around here anywhere, every, every spring, there's rocks that work their way up, uh, work their way up through the soils. And so they, the, the whole process of building walls was a, was a way to get rid of all of these rocks to a certain extent. But it was also a good way to make fences for, um, for their animals. And it's also where we get a lot of our boundary lines in and, um, in and around the area. So it wasn't in this early this early time period. And if, if you go back even um, doing some of the research here, again, here I'm pointing with my fingers like you can see me. Um, <laughs> uh, there's uh, around 18, you know, 1800, 1810 in the cemetery here, there's, they're talking about putting a wall around that it didn't originally have a wall. And they talked about in the town hiring somebody to build a wall, a stone wall for it, much later than it was actually set up, and that again, that's something that I've come across in a number of instances in towns where the the wall around the cemetery or the walls in general come much later. Um, things that are added, um, you know, in like the 1840s or so. I that seems to be um, when people were trying to. Uh, keep animals out. That's one of the things that you t hear a lot about in the cemeteries. People want to keep the grazing animals from trampling the, the gravestones. They build walls around them. So uh, that's, and it's amazing when you're out hiking around, uh, you, you see, you know, intersecting walls and they're following these valleys and um, it, it would have been a really difficult thing to do. And again, somebody had mentioned having uh, having laborer, you know, you would have had your laborers do that. And there's a lot of, this area was a lot of, a lot of people who immigrated, uh, Scots-Irish who immigrated from the 1730s onwards. Uh, the, the, a lot of those people, they come from sort of a tradition of wall building over there. And uh, they, 
you can see that in places here too, where a lot of those early uh, immigrant laborers were building walls in the in and around this area too. A lot of them from uh, the Northern Isles. Great. Uh, Terry, Terry Clark. Yes, thank you. Uh, Gail, that was, a, that was a wonderful presentation. I, I learned so much. I was, I was wondering if you could answer the one question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, there, there were a grouping of eight deaths um, centering around 1810, 1813, and that's when um, Elizabeth Burroughs, who was my fourth great-grandmother, died. Do you, do you happen to know particularly what that, um, what that disease was? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Uh, I, the, uh, that, uh, I did actually have, I have a, a podcast, two podcast shows about that, um, in my series, The Secret Life of Death, and what, what was a fascinating part of, of, of that research, um, was that, I learned a, a lot about these waves of epidemic disease that, again, coincided with a lot of the the immigrant influx or migration, rather, uh, people from not just southern New England moving to the north, but you have people who who had you know initially settled in a place like Alstead or Walpole, and for uh, maybe for political reasons, uh, depending on uh, the time period, they start to move farther north and farther north and farther farther north and it's almost like this uh this you can you can see um you can see the the progression of these diseases follow these uh migrations of people up the connecticut river valley and the uh the first episode from my podcast series is called epidemic and in that i erroneously thought that it was um that a typhus outbreak, but it actually turned out to be a meningo prob most likely a meningococcal disease outbreak that from from that first wave. But uh, I fortuitously made a connection to uh, a fellow archaeologist up in Connecticut, up in Connecticut, up in Canada, uh, Grant Myers, who was also studying that same wave of epidemic disease that had reached up into southern Canada. And he he found, you know, the very similar, uh, very similar type of, of of epidemiology in the cases that he was finding up in Canada as they were down here in um, in and around Alstead and and uh, the area. I I talked specifically in that episode about Ackworth because they had something ridiculous like fifty three people die within a, a three month period from this from these outbreaks, which was pretty, which is pretty outrageous. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing that, that, that it spread so quickly and was so virulent. That was the other thing is that people got sick a lot, you know, and then there were, but this, this seemed to be something different altogether and really, um, really took people out very quickly. And uh, I want, yeah, I wonder if the, as I, and I said it would come in waves so there would be there was uh, about in the 1812 and then there was another round of it in 1814 and it just seemed to make the rounds over and over again and very similar to what we have happening today if you were an older person or if you were particularly you know maybe particularly young or you had pre-existing conditions that just made you that much more susceptible to to any of the like, you know and there was all sorts of stuff like typhus and typhoid and um scarlet fever and and any you know pick your pick your poison they were they was these sorts of diseases were were circulating very very rapidly and um all throughout that time period Thank you. Um, okay, Martha. <laughs> yes. Martha. It's Martha, hello. <laughs> <laughs> After many months, <laughs> I reappear. <laughs> Do you I don't have a question. question. I oh, thank Gail. <laughs> well, 
You raised your hand. I wasn't sure. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. No, well, oh, thank you. Wrong. I'm so glad to see that you're there and love yeah. to hear your voice. Yeah. Well, this is, I will say, this is absolutely wonderful to hear because I think many of, I'm now on a cemetery commission for the town and many of our town cemeteries face these issues that you talk about, about unmarked graves, how do we plot them? And when you no longer have, um, kin related mm -hmm. people on the cemetery trustees, you really lose a lot of this information. So thank you. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. And it's, it's sort of in general about a lot of this, this early history when there's, when you lose that, the, the individual family people, uh, that connection to it, a lot of not just, you know, just the, the stories go away too. And, uh, the things, the, the chronology of what was done and, you know, who knows this will, you know, if those things aren't written down at some point, these are all things that like, oh yeah, everybody knows. And, but at, at a certain point, then all those people who always knew they're not around anymore. So it's, it's, it's hard to put the pieces back together when there's, you know, so many, so many details missing, but. I do have a question now that I think about it. Yeah. I was wondering when we were talking before about unmarked graves and who is buried in cemeteries, um, enslaved people, and maybe people who live on the margins mm. of uh, Anglo societies. Do you, have you seen in your walkings any evidence of burials beyond the walls? In this cemetery, I haven't, but um, that's always something I'm looking at whenever I, I go looking around cemeteries. Um, it's it, but it's hard um, for the a lot of times because this this particular one happens to be cleared all yes. around it for the yeah. most part. They're especially these old family cemeteries there off on this dirt road and all of the all of the houses you know there's no houses around it anymore these are uh old old um little you know communities that no longer exist anymore so i'm i'm sure there are because there's um how many references can you know have you come across over the years where it's so you know there's it's the precedent is set that that often happens where somebody couldn't afford a plot couldn't afford mm -hmm. some, you know the 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 the, nece the necessity to to be buried and maybe they didn't have somebody looking after them or or, or whatever and um I didn't come across any of that here, but then, but I also, I'm always thinking of that when you're talking about these early settlements too, before there was a cemetery set up, there had to have been burials uh, and I, that were unaccounted for that if somebody gets hurt or injured way out in the middle of nowhere, they're not going to drag them back to, they're probably just going to bury them where they find them. So it's the potential to have... <laughs> burials just kind of pop up and we have yeah. have had that happen historically in other parts not in Alstead but Walpole Bellows Falls we have very well documented cases where they've found burials mm -hmm. usually indigenous burials um, unmarked that pop up in in different in different areas so that is always a possibility too thanks Nice to hear from you. Yes, it's good to see <laughs> you and hear you. Thank you. Um, we have Dan. Dan Curl. Hello? Oops. Um, you're unmuted. Uh, you may be wanting me, although I've responded to an email from Dan Curl, but I'm not oh. Dan Curl. Oh. Is, that, is that okay? I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, this is Chris Hansen in Alstead. Oh, hi. Hi. I, I was wondering, I, I came in late, and I'm sorry, I, you may have covered this already, but you were talking about the the owners of the land and how some of them had gotten ownership and some were grants and some were sales and so on. But I'm wondering if going back to the original uh, 
claims to the land. Were, were there any arrangements made with the indigenous inhabitants in order to get a, a claim that then they could transfer at some point? Uh, no, nothing that I've ever come across. Uh, and that's sort of the, the, this, the, the kick of, of how the English tr treated the whole situation and that we'll go back to that. Uh, the map that I showed at the beginning, if you may, you might have missed it, but um, this this really early map that I, I just absolutely love from this uh, around 1750 or so shows what the where the majority of the population of New England was primarily um, to the the coast and also to southern New England, but these few little areas that showcase what the the English mindset they they were were constantly trying to push their settlements farther and farther upland and inland um, and these were all areas that as of 1850 or sorry 1750 were in the purview were were still considered part of indigenous territory and uh, but the English, of course, were never very good at honoring their treaties or honoring their word when it came to um, when it came to staying off of the land of indigenous people. And especially in 1850, we have forts over here at Fort Number Four, where there was a fort already down in Walpole, um, and these areas were set up, the area that would eventually become ousted was set up as part of this, this area that was slated to become um, these, this, these barrier areas as a frontier against the, the, in the Native American, any Native American, any indigenous encroachment farther south. Um, so that's sort of the mindset that the English were going into these treaty talks with that, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll stay off your land. But we're also eyeing this stuff as these these areas as potential buffers. And so, how do you make it a buffer? How do you make it uh, worth your while? You get you get it. You you know, English people set set up there to keep an eye on things, which of course goes against everything they technically agreed to. Um, and that's what that that little um, that's what this says up here that this was a double line of frontier towns against uh, the Indians. Um, so as, as far as I'm aware, after 1863, or sorry, 1763, at the end of the French and Indian War, there was, there was no attempt at setting up any kind of treaty for this, these areas that, um, that ousted would then eventually become a part of. There was no uh, even pretense of a treaty. At, at that point, the English were just, they just, uh, took it took over the took over in at least in their mind they took over their the control over that area completely whereas before it was sort of like oh yeah sure maybe <laughs> wink wink nudge nudge we'll let you we'll stay out of here but that was never their intent they were never going to follow through with that but um i've never come across in, in at least in reading the the town history stuff from from this area, Walpole, Elsted, uh, Bellows Falls area. I've never come across um, those when reading the early early uh, proprietorship information. Any reference to uh, them getting that land from indigenous people? It was just considered English pretty much by the at the they considered it English after the end of the French and Indian War. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, you may have answered this, so tell me if you have, but okay. is the cemetery visible from the road and is it accessible or is it on private land? You, you can kind of see it from the road. It's, it's set back off, uh, in, in it's in a field, but it's set back pretty far. There is a town right of way to the property. And if, so, so people can access it. Uh, it is the land all around it is owned by somebody else, but um, there is there is a town right of way, and I'm not in any position to tell. 
people how, uh, to, you know, how to get there. If, if they are interested in finding and going to look at it, they absolutely can because there is a right of way and the town actually owns the cemetery itself. So people can, people have access, people can go look at it. Um, they, I would suggest asking the cemetery commission of Alstead what the proper way to get to that piece of property is where exactly the right of way is because I don't want to tell somebody something incorrect and then you know have it be uh, have them be technically trespassing to to get mm. access. But there is a right of way that um, the town would be able to tell you how to access it. Great. Um, there was also a comment here that uh, it was called Trail or Rust Cemetery in the '60s. Oh, okay. Um, we have five more people. <laughs> With hands raised, so I'm going to okay. go to somebody else. Um, we have Ted. Oops. I think. Hi, Gail. Hi. Hey, this is old home day. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and so I'm Ted Benson, and I buried my brother Stephen there in 1974. So you have you've mm -hmm. definitely uh, seen that stone and, mm -hmm. and that internment area. Um, so a, a couple of things. Um, one is why and how that happened is a story in itself, and I won't tell that. But um, I can tell you that the right of way is definitely an issue, and um, I spend a lot of time. <laughs> personally trying to keep that right of way open and it's not easy yeah. uh, and it's it's not a um it's not an easily transfers uh right of way for sure um the the other issue that i wanted to ask you about uh, gail is because my brother is there and that cemetery is so important to me i probably spend more time there than anyone and um and I've taken on the maintenance <clears throat> of the cemetery. Uh, and it's a big job. <laughs> uh, the last year I was out there for three days, um, just clearing, thinning, uh, moving brush. Uh, and I, you know, I know the town has put some effort into it, but you know, that effort is waning, especially because of right of way is so difficult. Um, and I'm wondering what are the prospects for the Rust Cemetery for the future? In terms of the of preservation or? Preservation, maintenance, access. Well, that's definitely, I, I, I have had, had heard and know that there are some some problems with the access, which is why I didn't want to just say, oh yeah, just go blah, blah, blah. It's, um, I mean, I, I think as far as access goes, that sh has to, there's a cemetery commission that that's part of, as I understand their, you know, their purview is to keep things uh, like access and also the, the upkeep um, that that's part of what, what they, what they do. And uh, it's, it's too bad that the, it's been such a contentious issue that that there isn't the ease of access to it um, at the moment, because for for people like you, where that it has a very personal, me you know, special connection to that, you should have you know have access to it whenever you want to, and it's technically town land. So, um, and I'm assuming it's in the deed at some point. So I. I don't know as if I can really, you know, answer that, um, you know, I know what I should, I think should happen, <laughs> but um, it may be it's something on, you know, my, you know, we could talk about it sometime and, you know, work on something to address it with the town and, and see if something can't be some, some agreement can't be reached that's reasonable for everybody. And the, as far as the upkeep, it's, I keep, yeah, it's, it's a huge, even though it's a, it's a small little, you know, quarter acre plot, there's, there's lot, there's big trees there and the, the trees are a huge, you know, a huge issue for uh, the protection of the stones that are there when there are a lot of big, 
big pine trees and when one of those branches comes down it's it's a, it's a little scary as to what it's going to take out along with it unfortunately and and you know maybe that's something that the the commission might need to address at some point is maybe getting rid of the trees to help protect the help protect the 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 stones that are there because they're uh, the majority of them are very, in very fragile condition and that just it doesn't help having humongous trees dropping branches on them all the time and um, but if that's something you would you know you want to talk about sometime I'd be really I'd be open to that absolutely okay cool <laughs> Okay, um, I think Tom, Tom Durford, you can unmute. Hello. Hello, it is old home day. <laughs> Hi there, what a great presentation. Oh, oops, thank you. Really appreciate you to uh, do this. Um, Gail, um, what's the relationship of the cemetery you're talking about to the Pratt Road Cemetery? The one at the far end of Pratt Road? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, that, so that, the, the one that is in like in technically in Alstead Center it, orig was the, the earliest uh, cemetery set up by the village in uh, Alstead Center itself. And According to some early history, um, historical references, the earliest burial took place on, in that cemetery, but I think only by a few years um, compared to the one, uh, this the rust or the the trail, uh, the trail not trailhead. Um, I'm getting my uh, the trail cemetery or the rust cemetery, the one that I'm talking about out there, and, and that's kind of the. Also something that's that I find kind of interesting about this is that that one is set up by the town. So that's a, like a municipal burying ground as opposed to this one, which was more or less more or less a family, uh, a family burying ground, or at least the the not everybody was related, but they were all a, a specific little enclave that bought into this cemetery and personally as somebody who really likes cemeteries and goes around and looks at them a lot and reads about them and has a whole podcast about them. Uh, I think that's it, it's it's just a little bit of a different social structure that sometimes that that uh, that is just indicated by that. So whereas you have like this municipal uh, cemetery at the end of Pratt Road, this one is just for specific people from a from a specific family, a group, and just as an aside, that's something that you see in, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily the case in, in this area in Alstead, but in other places that I've, I've looked at and studied, the, set, the setting up of these individual family plots very much has to do with your, uh, where you come from in New England and your religious background. Um, I did this, another podcast uh, story about uh, the a number of cemeteries down in Halifax, Vermont, which is right on the border with Massachusetts. And a lot of those people came from Rhode Island and they were Baptists. And the Baptist tradition down in, Mass or, uh, down in Rhode Island was that every little farm, every family had their own individual uh, family burial ground down there in Rhode Island. And so when those families came up uh, and, you know, the same way that our families came up from Connecticut up to Alstead, these families coming from Rhode Island into Halifax, southern Vermont, east, uh, the whole southern, uh, southern Vermont area, they brought that tradition with them. And uh, as opposed to some of the other areas that were based on this, uh, on these congregationalists, um, who had, you had your church and then you had your burying ground behind the church. And that was very much at the center of town. So think of, uh, of Alsted Center like that, the way that that's set up, that's Congregationalist. Um, and the Rockingham, uh, the village of Rockingham that has the Rockingham Meeting House, their burying ground is out behind that, that's Congregationalist. Um, so 
initially when I was researching this, I was wondering if that was also the case here that the that maybe these guys were uh, they were Baptists, but though I think it was just more that they they were a uh, um, a very as we found as as we could see they're very interrelated intermarried group and they just had a lot of people that they needed to bury <laughs> and so s happened to set up their own uh their own family burial ground which was just a little unusual for this part of new hampshire it's or this part of new england they seem to have more of the mun municipal burying grounds around i don't know if that's what you wanted to know but <laughs> No, that's that's great. And thank you very much for the presentation. It was sensational. Thank you. Thank you for listening. All right. Um, let's see, George. Oops. I think I muted you when you unmuted. Try again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. George. Hi. Hi. Gail. I just wanted to give you a shout out. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you uh, many times on different projects, along with Martha Pinello and Garrett Evans. And uh, I have to confess, I'm a pretty much of a paleo snob, but um, you've inspired me to get more involved in historic archaeology. And um, during the COVID, I've been very close to home and living in Loudoun, and um, I've been exploring some of the cemeteries in town, and uh, your information tonight has inspired me even more to learn more about all about what they're all about. Uh, the one Wonderful. right here in Loudoun, uh, it is totally encompassed by granite posts, which are basically six inches apart. And it, it never made a lot of sense to me until you mentioned the idea of keeping uh, cattle out of the out of the graveyard, and uh, I think that's a pretty good uh, interpretation of that. <laughs> well, you bring up a really good point about some of the stuff that I'm pointing out might seem like a, a little kind of boring and arcane, but like from an archaeologist standpoint, when we come on to a, a site or when whatever it is, and you know, in this case, it might have, you know, cemetery, we're always asking, why does it look like this? Why is it set up like this? Why, you know, where is this road? You know, why is this out in the middle of the, you know, trying to figure out why things look the way they do. And part of the fun um, other that you know short of digging test holes which I, we didn't do any testing this we didn't dig anything up out here I don't mean to say that but when we when we're on a site that's that's kind of how we find out a lot of our information we dig up and we sift and we find the artifacts and we put the pieces together that way this doing research into a historic cemeteries is a little bit different there's a lot but there's a lot of documentation that we can look at as well as getting boots on the ground and walking around the cemetery and uh, you know wonder seeing why some summits why some stones face one way why they're facing another why some are made uh, you know with the with the different styles of uh, with the carvings on top all of that stuff means something too so you can really get into a lot of different uh, a lot of different so social uh, you know, learning about different groups and how they move around and uh, what sort of political and social and religious influences start showing up in these communities just based on cemeteries. That's, that's, and it's, like you said, it's everybody's got one in their, their backyard or their neighborhood. So that's a great place to, to start doing some research and, and learning about the, the local, you know, little neighborhood histories that way. Yeah, really. Um... It'd be interesting if you could get somebody to do some pro bono uh, ground penetrating radar mm -hmm. over those mysterious sites. Yes, yeah, it would it would be nice to be able to confirm uh, some of the some of the stuff that we showed up on the maps, whether that's real or not. And some of you know, and obvi obviously some of them are probably just the result of trees, old trees having upended and um, or root or uh, root balls rotting away to a certain extent. I'm sure that's part of it. Um, but the way some of them are just lined up so perfectly, uh, it really 
and, and there is also a history of there being unmarked, known unmarked graves in that site. But I would, yeah, I would love to get somebody out there with a, <laughs> some fancy equipment to run it over or uh, not run it over, but walk gingerly around yes. the gravestones. <laughs> Respectfully. Yes. <laughs> the, other, the other thing that occurred to me now is uh, some of the, uh, these, um, the Zoom, not Zoom, but the um, the different. Uh, I'm I'm lost for words on this part. Uh, where they bring up a uh, anyway. Uh, I guess I'm I'm out of here for now. I, I lost my train of thought, oh. <laughs> but uh, it was good. It was good touching base with you, and I have to. Thank uh, Bob Goodby for putting this all together. Oh, I know. I and so maybe hopefully someday soon we'll we'll all get to see each other again in person. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Thank it's you. It's nice very much. to hear from you. You too. Um, I have a, a couple of quick questions here. Okay. Um, who is the author of the the William Slade of Windsor, Connecticut, and his descendants book? That is. Tom, uh, Thomas Peck Bellows. Let's see. Let me fast forward here. It's got too many doodads. <laughs> Blah, burn, there we go. Uh, Thomas Pe Bellows Peck. I'm sorry. That's Great. the. Um, are your overlay maps available? for viewing or is that part of your website that you have the the survey that the survey the maps? maps yeah um i haven't set anything up on the website yet uh for this particular this uh this information my my plan was at some point to to do a podcast about it and at that point i would put mm. up all that info but right now I, I haven't posted any of this stuff. It's he just uh, he just finished actually doing the maps not too long ago, so I haven't finished playing with them yet. <laughs> okay. Um, the cemetery that's placed below the Rust Cemetery is that one accessible? Yeah, that one is right. Uh, well, sorry, I, there's another map. That one is right at the intersection of. Uh, Let's see where did that go? This we go. That one is right down here, Slade Cemetery. So that's right at the intersection of Pratt Road and Walpole Valley Road, and that's r right on the road. You you know, there's a little little pull off right there, and that one is easily easily accessible, right there Great. on the road. Um, and another question about have you compared your 1850s county map to the 1892 state atlas to see um, if the neighborhood had been heavily depopulated? Uh, Alstead had a steady decline in population in the 1820s, 1870s, and the hill farms are usually the worst. Yes, and I think that's in part sort of what you see with, with the, the switch of uh, you know, you sort of have a couple different things going on at the same time when this cemetery is getting full, but then you're also starting to see people, and so they're start using the other cemeteries, but then you're also seeing this outflux of people to the to New York and to the Midwest, and you're exactly those those hilltop those marginal farming areas were the first places to uh, where the population took a massive hit right off and sort of as an as an aside off of that that's a lot of times these old uh, these old family cemeteries or these old plots often fall into disrepair just for that reason that at a certain point there they there you know it's it reaches this tipping point where there just aren't there aren't the families around anymore who have any sort of connection to the burials in there anymore and so by the you know the late 1800s a lot of those have started to get grown over and uh, people start actually sorry to keep plugging my podcast but <laughs> Uh, I have a, a, a series about about a, a cemetery abandonment that is is directly related to that. 
uh, the episode, uh, episode seven, um, that talks about that very reason, because all of these people start leaving, and you might have one or two old timers left in town, but as soon as all of the young people start leaving, and then there's just, once something starts to, to look a certain, you know, it starts to look shabby and run down, then it makes it a lot easier for people to keep, uh, to keep abusing it and to keep treating it poorly. And then there's all sorts of, of stories from around New England and this area especially too, where these old cemeteries, people go in and start bashing the, the gravestones or they steal the stones. And that was a really common thing. I, when I started to research that, I was really surprised that that, that happened um, really early on, like starting in the 1850s, some of these old settler burial grounds were just being totally, uh, totally demolished by again, people taking the stones or letting their animals graze and, and trample the stones and stuff like that. But, um, but this, luckily this one seems to be in pretty good shape relatively there. Again, when they, they might've lost a few prior to the, uh, the 18 or the seven, the 1910 survey that we were talking about by that uh, Thomas Bellows Peck. Um, but since then, they, they haven't lost any. So it's it all, I think it all, it really matters how things are maintained, whether they stay, uh, they stay intact over time. Um, I think we're gonna go with one more. Oh, did we just lose it? Oh, she may have just left. I was just gonna call them the last person. So I apologize. Um, but I, I do want to say I saved the chat. There's a lot of comments. Oh, excellent. There, and there may be some other questions that I missed um, so that you can see those. OK. Um, we did record, just as a reminder, we did record this presentation. Uh, and so we'll be able to share that on the Historical Society of Cheshire County's YouTube page. Um, and our last question I have in here that just came through, too, do you ever need volunteers? Are you looking for a buddy? Wow, I've never been asked before. <laughs> Most of the time, it's just me, uh, you know, going out, going for a ride and seeing what, what I find. But, um, you, you know, it people. <laughs> that's wonderful. I would, I, I had a, a few people, I shouldn't say no one's ever asked me, but um, a few people have kind of, um, during COVID with some of the, the people who like my podcast have asked, oh, you know, if you ever do a, a cemetery tour or something like that, let me, let me, you know, I'd love to walk around and look at stuff. So something like that, as soon as maybe COVID's restrictions are, uh, are completely lifted, I think it would be kind of neat to, to maybe organize uh, to organize things like that to different cemeteries in the area if anybody was interested in that. And, uh, and if people are really interested and want to uh, get involved in documenting old cemeteries and saving old cemeteries, there is there are groups in New Hampshire and Vermont uh, that that's all they do. They help restore old old gravestone or old old gravestones and graveyards, clean them up. Um, and the the one in Vermont is a Vermont Old Cemetery Association. And the one in New Hampshire is the New Hampshire Old Graveyard Association, yeah. I think. Or yeah. I think and I think that's who we just lost is that oh. There's somebody from that. Oh, like, bummer. They're active. <laughs> so very good. Well, I mean, thank you so much. The, the Q&A lasted as long as your presentation, <laughs> which is wonderful. We could have kept going. Um, so I, I really appreciate you you coming out, um, all of you, all of you. And uh, this was a really wonderful presentation. And um, I just want to remind everyone, too, that as soon as we end this presentation, we have a survey. If you're so inclined, we would love for you to fill that out and um, and uh, continue to support us as we try to do pro more programs like this. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. This was great.